thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no heart, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hi, Dan. I'm Lindsay. Hello, Lindsay. Hello, sir. It is episode 92 today. It is. And I think the second story I'm going to tell is going to scare the shit out of you. Oh, good, because I think I have like a nice boom, 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 three stories this week, mm. all shadow people okay and it like i you know i sort of have a rule about not working on the stories at home but because i've been working hard on the book to get everything ready and mm-hmm. you're right we have to work so many weeks in advance which more details on book volume number two coming in the next several weeks but i had to get pretty far ahead mm-hmm. and it's hard to do all of that yeah in a confined amount of hours at the studio right so i was doing it at home and i just caught myself doing a lot of like <gasps> Ooh, nice uh-huh Okay, the second one had me uh, jumping too and just like looking over my shoulder and just getting like bad vibes. Bad vibs. So, uh, which is good for this show. Yeah. Uh, Were you spooping? Did you I, see my shirt? I was. Oh, oh, that's cute. Spooping. Oh, that's cute. That's so cute. I did not read it. You're welcome. Um, speaking a fan of sh- sent it. A fan oh, sent, sent it to me. I know. I wish I could remember who, but thanks. The, when I see the note and it comes in, I'm like, oh, this is so cute. And then things Between get... Between then and when we record, I know yeah. it's, we're always doing a variety Sorry. of things. But it's not because we don't care. Because we, we care, care very much. Yeah. Actually, uh, speaking of that, like my uh, our, our nephew, Emerson, yeah. came in here this uh, weekend before recording. He was uh, My sister was in town, and he's a huge fan of Scared to Death. It's so sweet. And he got to sit in your seat and get a picture. And just Cute. like him and my sister were just so amazed by all the stuff on the walls mm-hmm. and all of the fan you know submissions that have been sent in, artwork, occulty objects and everything. Yeah. And my sister just kept saying over and over, this is so cool. This it is so cool. It is cool. It is so cool. We have the best fans, truly. Truly. I feel like every podcast does that, but I would like battle them out for our fans. No, we're very, very lucky. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, and uh, a very sporty new merch. A couple quick announcements and then show. A uh, very sporty new merch in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Uh, scared to death basketball shorts and a basketball jersey. They are. I, I was surprised. I, I didn't know that, that was coming. I was like, oh, okay. Very cool. I flash back on like my high school self wearing yes. that stuff constantly. Yeah. They're both hilarious and amazing at the same time. <laughs> I love them. So you can get outdoors and active while staying dark and creepy. And then donation time. Trying something new this month. Mm-hmm. Instead of doing one big donation, we are spreading around the donation portion of the Bad Magic Monthly subscription to two charities. Correct. Uh, you know, every month we try to choose, you know, or every year, excuse me, various charities and various categories. Mm-hmm. And no year would be complete without us donating to an animal cause. Yay. We are pet lovers. Uh, we're donating a total of $14,100, half going to Trinity Stables in Georgia. They run a specialty program called Stable Moments, a weekly mentorship program that utilizes equine-assisted learning to achieve life skills that better prepare foster and adopted kids for healthy transitions into adulthood. So this is awesome. We're actually cool. donating to a child-centric cause as well. Right. Uh, for more info, go to trinitystables.net uh, slash spring break program. And our second charity is a Vintage Pet Rescue. This is so cute. Yeah, a Rhode Island-based nonprofit committed to rescuing "quote unquote" vintage, aka senior pets from shelters That's that are, you know, name. going to die in the shelter or going to be put know. down, and then they, uh, you know, uh, or they take them over from owners who can no longer care for their pets. Right. I know the head of this charity personally. Worked with her for a couple years. Uh-huh. Uh, Kristen cares so much, like obsessively, about these cute. animals. Uh, she's like an angel for old dogs. Her and her husband, Mark, and the team at Vintage Pet Rescue give these animals love, attention, and medical care for the last months and sometimes the last few years of their lives. For more info, visit VintagePetRescue.org. And I love that they're based in Rhode Island because our my second story also set in Rhode Island. Oh. Random coincidence. Well, I'm so glad I could line that up for you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Very now, much so. Now let's talk about stories. You said you have three stories I and do. they're all shadow people. That's the theme. I didn't okay. even intend for it to be that way yeah. and it just presented itself. So okay. here we go. I have one short one, one longer one. The short one is first and, it, and it's not, I don't think it's that scary. It's, it is the more you think about it. Mm-hmm. It's very weird. It plays with the concept of parallel universes Ooh. that a lot of smart multiverse believing people seem to think exist. 
And if they do exist, could you slip from one to the next? That's such a scary concept that, <laughs> yes. A, I'm not smart enough to wrap my head around. I just cannot quite get it. I mean, theoretically, yes, like at yeah. a very basic level. But when you get into the specifics of it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I I'm not a physicist don't either, know what yeah. you're saying mm-hmm. right now. That I don't know what language you're speaking. <laughs> I don't know if you have four heads. I don't know what the fuck is happening. But it is terrifying to me to think about somebody else literally living another life parallel to mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, many, Where many, never... many versions of you. Uh, ba- yeah, well, I'll get into that in the story. But yes, it's very <laughs> mind warping and scary when you think about like if you could slip from one parallel oh, universe to the next. I just got the chills thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And then what if you couldn't get back? What if you're in a world that looks so much like ours? What if that's where deja vu comes from? Right. Some people speculate that. Ugh. So it's very x filish It's uh, It's called The Man from Torrid. Okay. And then the second story involves a woman haunted by a terrible memory of seeing a strange and dangerous man in a Rhode Island amusement park as a young child, then having memories of this man, man, you know, quotes, stirred back up by her niece. Uh, was this man ever really there? Is she imagined? Is he still there? And is he actually a man? Like, what is he? It's a very disturbing tale that definitely gave me a lot of chills when I was okay. getting ready. Okay. All right. So, are you ready for these stories? I'm ready. Do you want to see my super cute socks? I have like a whole theme today. I'm all like, yeah, black you really and white. do. I know. I made a lot of effort. Wait, let's see. Like, very cute and kind of like a retro vibe because of the checkered skirt. I know. And the glasses. And the glasses, the cat rimmed glasses, a little bit kind of cat rimmed. Cat eye. Cat eye. Cat eye. Cat rimmed. What? what you, you got the gist. Weirdo. Is it called cat eye glasses? I always yeah. heard it as cat rimmed. Cat eye. Maybe you're thinking horn rimmed glasses. Maybe I am thinking. Maybe I combined mm-hmm. the two. You did. You did. You made your own word. I made my own word. You got you got cat eyes today. <laughs> Kitty, Kitty cat glasses. You have horn rims. <laughs> uh, no, no setup for this first story. We just jump right in when you're ready. Go. Okay. Time now for the tale of the man from Torrid. In 1954, a well-dressed Caucasian man disembarked from a busy flight from France to Japan's Haneda Airport in Tokyo. It was a particularly hot, sticky day. The airport was extremely busy. Just nine years after a devastating defeat in the Second World War, Japan was in a massive rebuilding mode and floods of people were coming in and out of Tokyo. With so much international travel, the immigration lines were long and slow. After waiting in line for what seemed like hours and already a little hot and bothered, the man reached the front of the queue and was asked by a customs agent to produce his passport. The man promptly obeyed, handing over a well-worn passport. And when the agent opened it, he immediately raised his eyebrows, shooting the man a confused and suspicious look. The passport stated that it was issued by the nation of Torrid. Torrid? The agent asked. I don't recall ever hearing the name of that country. Where in the world is this located? In Europe, the man replied, speaking fluent Japanese, along the border of France and Spain. The man's reply didn't ring any bells, so the agent passed the passport to the other, more experienced official beside him and asked if he knew of Torrid, believing it must be a small, obscure country he just hadn't come across yet. The second official, however, had also not heard of this country and suggested that such a country did not exist. Who was this guy? The passport looked real, had many legitimate-looking stamps from different countries. He had successfully boarded the plane in France, but there was no country called Torrid. The first agent now led the man to a small interrogation room at the back of the airport. He was sat across a metal table from a customs agent and a supervisor. Once the situation was explained to the supervisor, he pulled out a map and demanded, show me on the map where you're from. Where is Torrid? Looking at the map, the man quickly became visibly upset. He pointed to the principality of Andorra in the Pyrenees Mountains bordered by Fran and Spance. This is Torrid, he exclaimed. What is Andorra? Why would someone change the name of Torrid on the map? No one changed the name of anything, one of the agents stated, exasperated at such an absurd suggestion. The agents examined the passport again and remained so confused. Numerous stamps, all in the right places. Why would someone go through the trouble of making such a real-looking counterfeit passport, but make it for a country that doesn't and had never existed? It didn't make any sense. The man's driver license also looked legitimate and seemingly issued from a place called Torrid. Why would someone create two very real-looking documents from a non-existent nation? After some questioning, officials learned that the now sick-looking man was supposedly on a business trip. He told him this was his third trip to Japan that year. He produced his wallet full of various currencies from his travels. The Swiss francs were genuine, as were pesetas from Spain, Deutschmarks from Germany, and of course yen from Japan. The man spoke fluent French and Japanese, along with allegedly numerous other languages. He seemed legit in every way other than the nation he claimed to hail from did not exist. And he refused to admit that. He was adamant that not only was it real, but had existed for centuries. He spoke confidently of cities and historical events no one else had heard of. Officials gave up arguing about Torrid and began trying to determine the legitimacy of his trip. 
when asked, the man from Torrid produced official-looking documentation of a hotel booking and a letter arranging a meeting the following day with a company in Tokyo. When the officials called the number on the letter, the listed contact they spoke with had never heard of the man from Torrid. Same happened with the hotel. They called the number and were told there was no record of the reservation in question. When confronted with all of this, the man from Torrid grew angry, asking the agents why they were harassing him, still insisting that everything he told them was true. He asked if they were playing some kind of cruel joke on him and why. Not knowing what else to do, realizing they couldn't detain him indefinitely in a small airport interrogation room, the agents had airport security officers escort the man to a nearby hotel where he was to remain until they either somehow cleared things up and released him or decided what to charge him with and made an arrest. Once checked into his room, the man told the guards he was suffering from a terrible headache and lied down on the bed in order to sleep it off. The two guards then went outside the room, sat outside the door, where they remained for hours until some customs agents arrived a few hours later with some more questions. They knocked on the door and got no answer. At first, assuming the man was in a deep sleep, they knocked louder two or three additional times. When there was still no answer, they had someone from the hotel unlock the door and they found an empty room. Oh my gosh. More than just empty, it looked as if no one had ever been inside. The bed looked completely undisturbed, no sign whatsoever that someone had recently been laying on it. The windows were shut and locked from the inside. It was also a room on the top floor of the hotel and high enough that had the man climbed out of the window, he would have certainly fallen to his death. Stranger still, supposedly when the customs agents returned to the airport, they realized that not only had the man vanished into thin air, but so had his documents. His passport, driver's license, paperwork regarding hotel bookings and business contacts, the man's wallet, all gone all completely disappeared, never to be seen again. What could explain all this? Those familiar with this story seem to believe one of two explanations. The first is that some of this story, or all of it, is completely made up. Hmm. Documentation for this story is light, something it is nothing more than an urban legend. The second explanation is that the man from Torrid had slipped into our world from a parallel dimension and then slipped back out again. Those who believe the second explanation are likely familiar with the concept of the multiverse, a hypothetical and potentially infinite group of universes. And some who believe in the multiverse believe that there could be an infinite number of parallel universes, alternate timelines running right next to our own. In some of these, alternate versions of ourselves exist based on a nearly endless stream of different choices. What if you decided not to break up with that old boyfriend or girlfriend, and now there's another you with children with someone else? What if you didn't go to college? or switch your major? What if you took the other job you were offered, and now there are other yous out there leading other lives based on all these different choices, and so on and so on? Now extrapolate that over the entirety of human civilization. What if some conqueror did not win their war, and now a different nation was formed, and different people lived and died? What alternate timelines would that create? What if there are thousands or millions or billions of other versions of the global map? What if the man from Torrid was an interdimensional traveler slipping temporarily between our world and some other world right next to ours, unintentionally, and then he slipped somewhere else? How terrifying would it be to slip and never return to your original reality, to be lost not in time, but in an alternate reality? How long before you go completely mad? How lonely and scared would you be to slip suddenly into a world that looks so much like our, our own, but one where you know no one? Or one where you do know other people, but they don't know you? Other choices never put you in contact with their lives. Globally, the number of people who go missing and are never found, alive or deceased, is thought to be in the six, if not seven digits. How many of those people who disappear slipped out of this plane of existence? Are any of them out there somewhere, just as confused as the man from Torrid before he vanished? That is crazy. Isn't it a crazy thing just to think about? Just to consider that. I immediately... Mm -hmm. Do you have photos? I do. I, I do have some photos. Okay, I'll just be brief on this. I immediately was transported back to the last, I think it was the last international trip we took before the world shut down. We were coming back from Peru. Yeah. And Kyler, because he ate, kids changed the way they look so fast, you know, because they, and he like got pulled. Yes. They pulled him aside. We had to go into the uh, Bar Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. office. It was one of the scariest feelings I've ever had in my life because you realize that you're in this scenario where you have zero fucking power. Right. You have zero control over what is about to happen. And there was that. Yeah. I mean, we were fine. It was just a brief, you know. That, there was that other There was that family. lady. Mm -hmm. And like her kids were sitting over here. And I mean, it sounded shady AF. Mm -hmm. But she was, they were grilling her on like, well, why are you coming back? You came back at Christmas time. Why are you going to Virginia again? Where are you going? Like, it, but it was so right. uncomfortable even just listening to her being interrogated. Yeah. And I cannot imagine the feeling I would feel 
if I was in that scenario, I was like, no, I'm, I'm just trying to get to Idaho. And they're like, yeah. Idaho doesn't exist. I know. It's very Twilight Zone. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. It absolutely feels like a Twilight Zone episode to me. Ooh. Where, yeah, what if you just showed up and like the city that you've lived in your whole life, suddenly all the people at the airport are just like, Poof. that that city doesn't exist. Poof, gone. Oh my God. Oh, buddy. That would be, yeah, I mean, you would just, I, I would feel like I'd absolutely gone insane. Yep. But not quite. But I mean, God, if you just had all these memories, mm -hmm. I, I would just feel so panicked. I would I'd feel, be so scared. I think I might feel as though in my, somewhere in my brain, I think I would go to, do I have Alzheimer's? Is there something wrong with me? Like, I, I don't necessarily know that I would spiral out quickly about, no, I'd this wanna, is, this is real, up. this is real, this is real. Yeah. It would be like, wait, like, what's wrong with me? Yeah. Hi, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there are no pictures of the man from Tord, but uh, looking for one almost immediately led me to this first photo, which I just found too disturbing not to share with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just such a creepy photo. Someone did a great job. Yeah, making like, like ugh, the shadowy him in person. the hotel room mm -hmm, looking out, and then just like creepy figures wanting to get in. And then this second one I found so confusing. I just thought this was random. Okay. Uh, right below this one was <laughs> a photo of the musical artist Shaky Graves. Okay. And I'm like, what the hell? Uh, he has, it appears, some sort of unofficial album on YouTube okay. called The Man from Torrid. Full of, full of rarities, demos, and B-sides. I don't know if it's even authorized by him. It's not a part of it's not part of his official discography yeah. or discography. It's not on his website. Funny. But it shows up in multiple other kind of websites, and it does have a bunch of, like, demos, B-sides, and rarities. Okay. So if you're a big Shaky Graves fan, well, enjoy. I didn't know that that's what he looked like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that he always uh, – I mean, he's – he's uh, wears a lot of different type of outfits, but, yeah. <laughs> he's a cool-looking dude. Mm-hmm. You got good hair. You ready for our next story? Um, we can I just say one other thing sure. about this multiverse scenario? Yeah. Two things. One, it feels like choose your own adventure. Mm-hmm. But with so many choices. <laughs> well, yeah. But I mean, think about those books. It's here or here. It's here or here. Like, if you yep. think about life yep. in that way. It does. There are so many things. You know, like how sometimes you just think like, God, what if I would have done that? But then you can almost feel like you know what your life would have looked like. Yeah. Do you ever have that? Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I can really go far with it. Like, right. what, what if I would have gone here instead of here? Yeah. Well, then I would have ended up being this kind of person. And would I have met this friend? Probably not. So I would have been here. And then, oh, but then like I dated this person who's from that state. Would I have run into them? Would I have met? Like, I can, yep. I can go pretty and, fucking and far with it. And there's the big ones. I think about there's the big ones. I think a lot of, especially as you get older, you have these, these big life moments where you look back. Yeah. And you're like, okay, this person wanted to marry me, but mm -hmm. I didn't want to marry them. And like those kind of things. Right. But you're but like, maybe I waffled for a second. Like mm -hmm. that choice would have set my life in such a different trajectory. Yes. Or it's like I was looking at some, uh, you know, grad schools right after college. Mm -hmm. it'd, be, it'd be deciding between that and comedy. What if I would have picked and actually entered the program? Wait, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that this was factual. Who else wanted to marry you? Oh, I'm talking about like old, like high school, like oh, a like, okay. like high school girlfriend, you know, like, like, like a young. <laughs> who proposed to you? Do tell, do tell. Uh, um, and then, and then there's all the little things. Yeah. Where it's like I think like okay, you're getting ready to leave the house, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, my phone. Mm -hmm. And then you go look for it, and you and you can't find it. And it takes you a while. Well, what if you had left the house? more quickly mm -hmm. and unbeknownst to you you would have gotten in a car accident you know oh, like, right. like all, the, those... all those choices that you don't know about i know i know there's always something i think working in the background and also i just had this thought this is my yeah. other thing maybe aliens live in a different plane than us they slip on over and they slip over to observe and then they slip back Ooh, but yeah there, there is like, people... like alien abductions like when you yeah. just go missing yeah there's people who go deep on like um interdimensional travelers, I think they call it, you know, okay. uh, people who speculate about, you know, like if that were to be again, you know, possible, obviously, um, what that could open up all kinds of crazy stuff. It would that, be that gets cool into a lot of like, uh, theosophy and like the Lemurians and the Atlanteans and kind of, a uh, some beliefs that are interesting. It would um, be cool if you, if it were real and you could go and then you could come back and be like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. It would be super cool. If, and yeah. as long as you weren't like crazy, if someone very scientific or reputable, yeah, people right? could document you leaving and coming yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, oh, man, that'd be awesome. I think family vacations would take on a whole new meaning. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, okay, so are you ready for the next one now? I am. I picked the first one just because it added something new to be afraid of and just think about uh, that I don't remember discussing here before. For sure. This next one, just classic campfire horror, uh, telling it just uh, just to give as many people as possible the chills. I'm going to start a fire. <laughs> 
Uh, no setup for this next story. Okay, great. Either. So no setup for either one today. Have at it. Time now for the tale of Mr. Fun. <laughs> Sorry. I don't like that name. Mm-hmm. Oh, you, yeah, you won't like him. Okay, I'm just going to get in. Sometimes Kira thought she could recite the jingle for Rocky Point in her sleep. Rocky Point, it's so exciting. Rocky Point, where well, you can come alive. Rocky Point, you're all invited to share our summertime. That's beautiful. Rocky Point. As a child, she couldn't get this out of her head. It's not like Kira had been to Rocky Point a hundred times or anything, but she'd heard that song what felt like a million times. They played it on the rock radio station her dad listened to when he took her to school in the morning. She felt like she'd seen the commercial on TV a thousand times after school. Fuzzy 80s camera shots, people jumping off diving boards into the clear blue water of the big Olympic-sized pool, uh, people getting strapped into the roller coaster seats by attendants and polos. It wasn't like that in real life, though. The few times she'd been, she'd been hot, dehydrated with a big group of people that she was afraid of losing. <laughs> By the time she's old enough to go with just one friend or her little sister Taylor, she quickly stopped wanting to go altogether. And she hated Rocky Point after she saw the man in the cave. The man with the eyes she would never forget. Hungry eyes in the worst possible way. Taylor had wandered off to use the bathroom when she saw him. And by the time Taylor came back, he was gone. Taylor got mad when she wouldn't stop talking about him. She thought her big sister was just trying to scare her, and Kira supposed she was right. She was trying to scare her, but not to be a jerk. She wanted her little sister to be scared because she knew that they should be scared of the man she saw. She didn't want her or her sister to be anywhere near him. Her parents made her go a few more times after that, but because of Kira's fear, uh, oh yeah, because despite Kira's fears, Taylor loved it. But when they saw how freaked out Kira got every time she returned, eyes darting around looking for him, refusing to go anywhere near the cave, they finally gave up. And when she begged them not to let Taylor go either, they gave up on the amusement park altogether. There were other things to do, and since Kira didn't throw a fit about literally anything else, it was a battle they decided just to not keep fighting. Mm -hmm. Kira had nightmares for a while after she stopped going, frequent at first, then in infrequent ever since. She thought she'd be able to forget about it eventually, and maybe she would have. If it wasn't for that damn jingle, every time she heard it, it made her think of the man. Rocky Point, it's so exciting. Rocky Point, where well, you can come alive. Rocky Point, you're all invited to share our summertime. Rocky Point, such an earworm. Thank God it had been off the air for years. Rocky Point closed down by the time Kira was in college. Now Rocky Point was just some information signs put out by the Rocky Point Park Pathways Project talking about the old roller coasters and other rides like the Skyliner and a few old remnants of these rides, old metal bases and concrete foundations. Kira actually hadn't thought of Rocky Point for years until her niece, her sister Taylor's daughter, started coming over to Kira's after school. Kira worked from home, so looking after her sister's daughter Olivia a couple days a week wasn't that much of an inconvenience. Her sister was a single mom and Kira had a good job in IT and could make her own schedule. And she actually liked having seven-year-old Olivia around. She was a really smart kid, and spending time with her reminded Kira how real and serious childhood could be. Not just light and fluffy and insignificant like toys and TV shows, and sometimes even memories made it out to be. Kira always enjoyed spending time with Olivia, at least until she found some old childhood tapes of Kira's. What's this? Olivia asked one Tuesday afternoon. Kira was making grilled cheese sandwiches on the stove, Olivia just out of her sight line on the carpet in front of the TV. Olivia said she'd found something in an old box, and at first Kira panicked. What if it was her weed? Taylor would kill her. Kira lunged around the corner and into the living room and saw, thank God, it was just a bunch of dusty tapes. Oh, uh, Olivia was just staring at her with a curious expression. Just some tapes, home videos, your mom might be in some of them. I think we have a VCR player somewhere if you want to watch them. She went back to making grilled cheeses while Olivia found the VCR. Just as she slid the first sandwich onto a plate, she heard it. That damn jingle. Rocky Point. It's so exciting. She almost ran back into the living room. Olivia was sitting on the floor watching the old Rocky Point commercial from Kira's childhood. She saw the same people happily slurping ice creams forever frozen at 12 years old and some people screaming happily on the roller coaster. Someone must have taped the commercial over a video, Kira said. She wondered if any of the kids in that commercial ever went missing. She'd heard rumors that a lot of kids who went to Rocky Point ended up going missing. Just rumors. But she knew deep down they were true and that the man she saw was responsible. She shivered. She hated that she was thinking about that man again now. Olivia's eyes were wide, her attention drawn to the TV screen like a magnet. Kira thought she must have taped that stupid commercial over footage of her and Taylor walking around their childhood home pretending to give it to her. Olivia loved seeing the old footage of her mom. All Kira could think about was the cave, the man, the eyes. She knew her old nightmares would be back. 
Kira tried to focus on just making lunch, and when she was finishing up the second sandwich, she heard it again. The faintest hum. <laughs> Had she taped a commercial over her old home footage twice? She then thought for a second that maybe she'd started subconsciously humming the old jingle herself. It wouldn't be the first time she'd sang idly while doing some task. And then she heard it again. <laughs> it was Olivia. An unexpected shiver clawed down Kira's spine. She didn't like that song was now in Olivia's head as well as hers. I guess that was the point of a good jingle, she told herself, to be memorable. She brought out the sandwiches and asked Olivia to shut off the TV. Kira would never watch that tape again, but the damage was already done. She now couldn't stop thinking about Rocky Point. She felt drawn to Rocky Point's old exit on the freeway, strangely. She started to wonder if he was ever really there. Did she just make it all up? She wondered if he was there now. She knew that the old amusement park would probably be rubble by now, but the cave, she knew it would still be there. Would he still be inside it? It was the weirdest feeling, to want so badly to go back and look. To be so drawn to the one place she'd worked so hard to avoid for so many years. Soon her sister Taylor was going out of town for the week and needed a babysitter again. A bachelorette party. I know it's ridiculous, Taylor said over the phone, but it looks like a lot of fun. And if I could get the time off work, so I can watch Olivia. Don't worry about it, said Kira. Kira didn't hesitate to offer to watch her niece. Taylor had gotten pregnant with Olivia when she was 20 and had spent the entirety of Olivia's life trying to provide the best thing she could for her daughter. She'd made a ton of sacrifices and hadn't had all the wild years of partying that Kira had. Now that Kira had a good income and she'd bought a nice townhouse and work, she felt like she needed to help Taylor in whatever way she could. Thank you, you're a life sister, her sister gushed. The following Monday, Kira picked Olivia up from school. It was their little tradition for Olivia to show Kira what she'd worked on that day at school, so at home... They'd leaf through pages of spelling exercises until she got to an art project that Olivia had made, a painting of a yellow flower in a large red pot. Kira hung it up on the fridge, and they had fun, uh, a fun evening of playing board games and eating pizza. The next two days were more of the same. Another art project hung up on the fridge, a pillow fort built in the living room, more carb-heavy kid comfort food. Then on Thursday, when they were going through Olivia's school projects, Kira turned over a page in her folder and stopped. It was a drawing of Rocky Point. And it wasn't anything Olivia would have ever seen in that commercial. A feeling of dread washed over Kira. Olivia had drawn the top station of the Skyliner, that big, slow, moving chairlift of a sort that took you around the whole park. The one on the rocky point the amusement park was named after, with the cave beneath it. How could Olivia have known about that? Just then, Olivia began to sing the jingle. Rocky Point, it's so exciting. Rocky Point, where you can come alive. Kira's blood went cold, and she stared silently at Olivia while she sang. When she was done, Olivia asked, disappointment in her voice, You don't like my drawing? No, I do, Kira re reassured her quickly and weakly. I, I just... Did you look up pictures of Rocky Point on a computer or something? Olivia shook her head no. Kira's head was beginning to ache. She could hear the sounds of her childhood at the park again, the sounds of children screaming, laughing, crying. I'm going to take a shower, she told Olivia. Go watch some TV or something, okay? In the shower, she tried to be rational about everything. Even if Olivia said she hadn't looked up Rocky Point, maybe she'd just seen a picture of it somewhere. But what were the odds? That picture that she found would be of the exact spot she was so terrified of. She got the chills. He was still there. She didn't know how, but he was. When she got out of the shower, she strained to hear the sounds of Olivia's TV show, and she didn't hear anything. She put on a bathrobe and went down the hall, calling, Olivia? Olivia? No response. She called a little louder now. Olivia, where are you? Had Olivia walked out of the house while she was in the shower? But to where? To Rocky Point? No, please, no. She knew she wasn't supposed to go anywhere without telling someone first. She'd never broken a rule like that. Kira's heart started pounding wildly. Here! Kira jumped and whirled around. Olivia was standing behind her in the doorway of Kira's guest bedroom. Kira pressed her hand to her heart. Oh, Jesus Christ. Thank God she was in the house. Now that she wasn't so scared, she was curious. What had Olivia been doing? Why hadn't she been watching her shows? She loved watching TV. What kid didn't? Olivia told her she'd been working on some more drawings just for fun. She took Kira's hand and led her to the guest room. Scattered across the floor were art supplies and new drawings, all of Rocky Point. Kira's heart pounded. What was going on? There were pictures of the Skyliner, concession stands, the pool, the arcade, some of the roller coasters. She'd been busy. Also, in every drawing, every single one, there he was. The man from the cave in every picture. He'd look little more than a stick figure to most people, but to Kira, she could see him as clear as she'd seen him that day. And there was someone else she recognized. As if reading her mind, Olivia said, That's you, Aunt Kira. 
It was unmistakable. It was her haircut as a child, her glasses. She was in every picture, and in every picture, he was watching her. Uh. He was watching her ride the roller coaster. He was watching her dive into the pool. And then picking up one of the drawings, looking at it more closely, she found one last sketch underneath that she'd missed. The man was holding her hand in this one, and he was leading her into the cave. Rocky Point, it's so exciting. Rocky Point, where you can... Olivia, that's enough! Olivia looked hurt. Sorry, I was just singing. You don't like it? You don't like any of my drawings either, do you? I can tell. Tears welled up in her eyes. No, said Kira, putting her hands on Olivia's shoulders and lowering herself down to her level. It's not that sweet. It's just, who is this guy in the drawing? Olivia's eyes lit up. That's Mr. Fun! Isn't that a silly name? He takes the best kids from the park into his cave, where he has all the best treats and toys. Kira felt sick. How do you know about him, honey? I don't know, Olivia wondered, her eyes looking up and her brow furled comically in a deep little kid concentration. He just showed up in my dreams. Oh my god. I think he knows you. How would he? Kira stopped herself. She didn't want to know the answer. Hey, she said, changing the subject. Did you know I have all the ingredients for strawberry shortcake? Even Cool Whip, asked Olivia, eyes wide in excitement. Even Cool Whip, said Kira. Thank God little kids were easily distracted. That night, Kira slept poorly. The nightmare was back. The man leading her into the cave, worried about what he would do, knowing that it would all end with him actually eating her, devouring her somehow, always waking up after she'd been swallowed up by the cave's darkness, able to see nothing but his Cheshire, Cheshire cat grin. Olivia humming that godforsaken jingle over and over didn't help. What was going on? She knew she had never talked about that man around Olivia. Had Taylor mentioned him? If so, why wouldn't Olivia just say that? If she told her mom about him now, her mom was going to be pissed. She'd obviously assume that Kira had told her niece about the man. What else would she think? That man, whatever he was, he was still there for sure. She had never imagined him. And now, somehow, he was speaking to Olivia. What if he called her to him? What would he do to her? She shuddered. The next morning after dropping Olivia off at the school, Kira drove straight to Rocky Point. She had to go to the cave. She had to go there and not see him, to know that he wasn't real, to know he wouldn't come for her niece. She parked her car where the old gate used to be. Not much of the old park remained. Walking towards the old skyline or boarding point, she could hear all the old sounds, though. The whoosh of the roller coaster drop, the sound of kids playing carnival games, kids splashing and screaming in the pool. She walked down to what was now a nature trail towards the cave. Everything was so overgrown. Thank God she'd come during the day, she thought. She didn't like to think about how dark this area would be at night. Soon she saw it, the little cave at the base of the rocky bluff, still there, just like she remembered. Of course it was still there. It was there long before the park was built. Hello? She called towards it. Anyone here? No answer. Hello? She called louder, feeling a bit silly. Anyone in the cave? Any creepy, child-eating monster hiding around here? She mocked. She started to laugh at the absurdity of all of it, and then rustling behind her. She spun around in a panic and saw something moving in the brush. A squirrel. She started to laugh now. She'd literally almost had a heart attack because she thought a squirrel was a monster that she had convinced herself used to haunt the amusement park she went to as a kid. A monster that looked like a man with murderous eyes she now worried wanted to eat her and her niece. Oh my god, she said out loud to the squirrel. For a second there I thought you were Mr. Fun. And then she turned around and about had a heart attack again. Fuck! There he was, oh my god, standing in front of the cave, clear as day. Hello, Kira, <gasps> he said. I've missed you. What? No, she said, beginning to tremble. No, you're not real. Oh, I'm very real, he said. Kira hated the look in his eyes. They were hypnotic. They were also completely insane. They were the eyes of someone capable of anything. But he wasn't someone, was he? He hadn't aged a day in around 20 years. What do you want? Kira squeaked out. I just want to show you something. I just want to show you what's inside, where the real ride is, he said, as he gestured, gestured towards the cave. Here, take my hand. Oh my god. No, Kira said. She was shaking now. Take my hand, Kira. You don't want to make me mad, do you? I've waited too long already. Please, Kira whispered, frozen in place. You're scaring me. I know, said the man, flashing a predator's toothy grin. That's why you come here, right? To be scared. Being scared is fun. That's why you all went on the rides. But you didn't go on mine. And no one can scare you like I can, Kira. Nothing will scare you like what I can show you. Once you see what can be, nothing else will matter. Mr. Fun now grabbed her wrist <gasps> and started to pull her towards the cave. Kira's paralysis broke and she screamed and dug in her heels. She scrambled and tried to rip away from his grip, but he was too strong. He was steadily dragging her towards the mouth of the cave now as she kicked at the ground and screamed for help. Then, maybe ten feet from the cave's entrance, she heard another voice. Hey, are you okay? She spun around to see a young, athletically built guy in runner's gear sprinting towards her, and then she fell to the ground. 
She looked back towards where, where Mr. Fun was and no one was there, <gasps> at least not right in front of her. But in the cave up ahead, she saw those eyes again, just like she'd seen when she was 13. The jogger was now kneeling beside her, helping her up. Are you okay? He asked, looking freaked out himself. Looked like something was dragging you, he added. Something was, she said, uh, backing away from the cave. Something inside there, she pointed. Something evil. She continued warning him. Don't ever come here alone again. She quickly thanked the guy who was backing away from the cave himself now, and then she ran back to her car, but not before she took a second to examine her tracks in the dirt. She had clearly been dragged. No one could have made those marks she'd made in the dirt alone. He's real. Whatever the fuck he is, he's real. Her wrist ached from where he grabbed her. Kira drove home and took that old tape with a jingle on it, threw it in the trash, and then immediately took the trash out to the dumpster and threw it in there. She did the same with all of Olivia's pictures as well. Her sister Taylor came home the next day and Kira made her promise to never go to the nature park where the old Rocky Point Amusement Park once stood. And don't let Olivia go. Taylor was so annoyed, just like she was when she was a kid. But just like her parents, she gave in to Kira's demands because it was the only crazy thing her sister demanded and she was so adamant about it. Olivia still hums that jingle sometimes. Kira's nightmares have returned a lot more frequently than they were before. In her sleep, she seems doomed to walk into that cave over and over again and not come back out. When she wakes up from those terrible dreams, she almost always wakes up with that damn song in her head. Rocky Point, it's so exciting. Rocky Point, where you can come alive. Rocky Point, you're all invited to share our summertime. Once you see what can be, nothing else will matter. That was not nice. That was not nice at all. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I got an extra jump. I, yeah, I didn't expect hey. that of you. Eek. Creepy, right? <laughs> Nice touch, Joe. <laughs> that was good. Well played. Uh, okay. Eek. That was okay. Wow. So okay. Be, so before we talk, a couple photos that'll make it even Ooh, creepier, I think. Okay. Uh so first one, this is an old photo of Rocky Point Amusement Park, uh yeah, Warwick, Warwick, Rhode Island, before it closed in 1994. This place first opened in 1847. It was there for a long time. And then this next one is remnants of the old lower Skyliner station. So this is where, like, you would get off. Oh, oh, I get it. I get it. Okay. And then this first one, this is the cave below the old Skyliner station. Oh. And then right up above those rocks, that rocky point, are remnants of the old Skyliner station. Uh, This final picture. So that cave is right below there. You can just see up in the up in the top, yeah, like yeah, just yeah. the old rusted out top. Ooh. So it's a real place. Well, I never doubted that it yeah. was. Yeah. Yee. Oh. Wow. It it has like an element of um um it. It mm-hmm. feels like it. You know? Like, like a pennywise type. Uh-huh. Just like always lingering, always there. Like you're never free of it. Mm-hmm. Oh, buddy. And how did it get to Olivia? What a weird thing. The tape. I know, but what? So by playing the tape, she just, it was, he was working his little, I yeah. don't know, tricks on yeah. Olivia to get to Kira. Right. Who knows? I mean, Some that's kind so of, bizarre. Mm hmm. Because just the accuracy of what Olivia was drawing. Mm hmm. That is fucking creepy. I was mad at Kira for going to fucking Rocky Point. I was there's a little bit of a Darren move. A little bit of a Darren move. She didn't need to do that. Well, it would have, it would have been a good move if she would have went there and saw nothing. It would have given her, I think, a lot of relief. Mm-hmm, but she went there alone. No one knew where she was. She didn't mm-hmm. like attempt yeah. to yeah. record it or take any sort of True. anything with her where she could prove anything. No, it's it a bit Darren, like a like a fifty percent Darren. Yeah. Yeah. True. Now, where I grew up in Ohio, uh, we had... Yeah, what was the name of the place? Well, there's two. There's still there. There's King's Island. Oh, the one that's still there is Cedar Point. Oh, okay. Cedar Point is still wild. It wild. is the best theme park in the world. <laughs> it is so, so good. good. It's so good. But then there's all there huh. There was also Geauga Lake. So Geauga is a county. So it was in Geauga County. So it was Geauga Lake. Yeah. And it's very similar 
to what you just showed me to Rocky Point. We're just, huh. you know, not that big, but also not that small. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, had like the giant wave pool. I, I don't know. Like it just, I went there a few times because you could do the reading program at school and then I think you would get <sighs> okay. like a free ticket. It's kind of like, reward. yeah, like yeah, our kids cute. get like Silverwood or whatever for reading. Yep, yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, I went to Geauga Lake enough times that in my mind, I was like, oh, God. And it is. Amusement parks are weird that way. When you're like a little kid, they feel so exciting, yeah. overwhelming, overstimulated. But then as you do get into like your tween years, as they right. call them now, you're not as enchanted with it because you, I think for me, I would see, you know, the 15, 16 year old and I wanted to be there by myself. But yeah. just like Kira, by the time I could go by myself, I was like, oh, this is fucking stupid. <laughs> so then what you do for us, what it was is it was like a chance to go with all your friends and, you know, the girls. It was like a mating call, you know, dance uh, around sure, in your little sure. bikinis and, you know, trying to get the boys <laughs> attention. Yeah, prove yeah. How cool you were by mm -hmm. going on the scary rides. But you were always just a little bit scared of getting separated. And I don't know when that feeling kind of stops mm -hmm. because I felt that for many, many years. And now it's like, well, I'm an adult. I have a cell phone. I have yeah, money. Yeah, yeah. Like I can find my way out of a situation. But you know that feeling when you're a kid that you don't want to be separated from your parents and it just carries on for right. so many years until you reach, I guess, a certain point in your adulthood. But man, so I was in my mind, I was at Geauga Lake or the other one is uh, Kings Island, which I only yeah. went to once. But oof. Ooh. Here's a fun piece of trivia. It's because you mentioned both of them. Yeah. yeah. You know the Mindy Racer at Geauga Lake? Yeah. That is now Aftershock at Silverwood. What? Yeah. Oh, they will move equipment So around. it used to be, yeah, it used to be green, and it was the Mindy Racer. They moved it here, painted it blue. Whoa. I know. Small world. <laughs> Bye. 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 I wish I can't think of that. That's awesome. I can't think of the park now, but one of the big rides from Rocky Point yeah. actually moved to a, an amusement park in Western Washington. I just can't remember what it's called. Huh. But I'm like, oh, that's crazy. They would just like dismantle this huge thing, put it on a train, I guess, and ship it. I guess cheaper than rebuilding it. Yeah. When I was in college, uh, a friend of a friend of mine, he was hmm. a roller coaster engineer. Like, I don't know exactly what kind of engineering that was, but he always said, he, he's like, well, I'm a roller coaster engineer. And he got to travel Weird. the world and try, roll, like, go on roller coasters <laughs> and try them. That's so cool. And then, you know, report back to his company and then use yeah. that, you know, as market research and, yeah. um, like, hands-on tactile research. And, yeah, but, man, that story is gonna fuck with me. Did I've already just... See some eyes in the darkness and wonder about Mr. Fun? No. More like abandoned places will carry a whole new element of like, what could be there? Why is it abandoned? What's the story? Like, we're, and like the kid abduction stories around Rocky Point in my mind, I was like, did kid, were kids abducted at Jug Lake? Were kids abducted at Cedar Point? Like, a, an amusement park is such a scary place yeah. as a parent to think about losing your kid. Yeah. When you said what can be there, uh, we were talking about Stephen King a second ago. Another reference popped in my head where it's like, the ground sour. Just uh, Excuse me? Pet Cemetery. I never like, saw it. Like the, the ground's evil. Never mm -hmm. saw it. The old one or the new one. Mm, I saw both. Oh, that's good for you. <laughs> you can imagine why I didn't see it, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. That is a really fucking creepy story. It's just, it's, it's a lingerer, mm -hmm. as you might say. It's a whole It had me jumpy when I was working on it. It did? Mm hmm Well, you grew up in a place where there weren't amusement parks. Right. There was no amusement parks. <laughs> Looking back, I'm amazed this place ever came through town. Well, two oh, places. Oh, I know what you're going to say. I, I don't know. I, God, I wish I could remember. I wish I could find a flyer somewhere. My family, they don't remember the name of this place. N nobody I've ever asked remembers the names. It almost feels like it didn't happen, but I know it did. And, the, and my grandma and mom remember these places coming to town. But there was a carnival that came through. Oh, was that your knee? That, that, was, that was my ankle bone. Ooh, ouch. Yeah, no, it uh, felt great. There was a carnival that came through. And again, if you haven't heard, sorry, my little town, Riggins, Idaho, it's like 300 people now, maybe, maybe 500 people when I was a, a kid at this time. Mm -hmm. It was a steady decline for quite a while now. But like a little teeny town and not like a little teeny town next to a bigger town. Right. Where there'd be more population to pull from. Little teeny town near nothing. <laughs> like an hour's drive from a slightly bigger town. Right, right. And, and yet this carnival came and it's set up in the parking lot next to the post office and it was there for like two days. That is not a big parking lot also. No, it was just a little, but it had like a few little tiny rides. Okay, that okay. Were so, like, even as a kid, I was like, that looks rickety. <laughs> and, and then like, you know, like throw the darts at the balloons to yeah, win some yeah. really crap. And just like weird looking carnies, at least in my kid's mind. I was like, these people are going to kidnap me. I and, know. And then there was a circus in the parking lot of the old Salmon River Inn where the grocery store is what? now. An actual little one ring circus 
set up in that parking lot. And I remember having to walk past it to go to lunch, to go to my great grandma's house. Yeah. And being so worried about being kidnapped. Oh, <laughs> being kidnapped. Probably because a... I read Stephen King as a kid. Well, I'll also, being kidnapped is a very real fear. Right. But of... I'm like, I'm like, the circus is coming through town. And they're just going to fucking grab me and mm-hmm. move along. And then my parents will never find me. Yep. And... and even as a little kid, I'm like, why the fuck is the circus in Riggins? I know. That's what Am I'm I supposed to have a circus here. What kind of animals did they have? I don't even remember, but I just remember there were no it was animals. So it was just people. Low rent. They might have actually had like one elephant. But that poor elephant. I can't remember like that part of it clearly, but I'm like, but yeah, it just it felt both of those things felt so creepy. Just like there's not enough people here. I'm, my mind bounced to American Horror Story Freak Show. Mm-hmm. That was a good season. I'm sure it was like off nights for those places. I'm sure they were traveling through. Yeah, and it was like, well, we got to stay we'll somewhere extra- Monday night. We'll yeah, make an extra. Couple bucks, help, yeah. Yeah, help cover our travel costs. Right, right. Ugh. Yeah. What I think about is like in those scenarios, what we would see where I grew up again in Cleveland um, or outside of Cleveland was what we called home days. We've talked about this before. So it's like the equivalent kind of of like um, like the like the county fair, okay, but smaller. Yep. And they were like per city because we also had a county fair, so it would be you know a handful of small rides, yeah. nothing nothing big, a lot of food vendors, and a lot okay. of like face painting, henna tattoos, oh, the yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, man, I'll have to point it out to you the next time we're in Cleveland. But my in Strongsville, that was like. That was an expensive neighborhood or an expensive city to live in. So they had a really nice one. But then there were other cities where it was like not as good because they sure. didn't have as much money. But it was that kind of thing. You'd see all the trucks roll up and all the trucks roll out. And those rides, I was like, I'm not fucking getting on that. <laughs> right. Like, like I don't know what road it's been bouncing down. Mm-hmm. I don't know what kind of mechanic you travel with. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no way. Yep. No way. Okay. You ready to get shadowed? I am. Oh, buddy. Yep. Oh, buddy. I'm excited. I had a little bit of coffee this morning. Okay. Just letting you know. <laughs> okay, so we are off to Canada, the land that you may not go to. And uh, it's just a teeny tiny little story with, in my opinion, a very big payoff. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we have a visual confirmation of shadow people at the end of this story. I, I think, I think. Um, so at the end of the story, I'm going to show you one little photo. And I'm curious, like, you know when... I love how I say that every week. You know how you notice your own weird idiosyncrasies? Mm -hmm. I say, I'm curious if, has anybody else picked up on that? It's so obnoxious. I hadn't. Oh, well, I find it very annoying. Um, I wonder, you know how when your phone will randomly take photos, like you press too many buttons. Mm -hmm. What if you randomly caught something on your phone? What would you do? Like, would you try and figure out, like, where it happened? Would you go back there? Would you try to recreate it? Like, mm. Yeah, I guess it depends on what it was. But, yeah, possibly if something like some paranormal-ish, you know, photo, I, I yeah, I would want to know where it came from. Okay, okay. Well, what if it was in our house? Uh, that's super creepy. Like, if you don't remember, like, it couldn't be a pocket dial type photo. Yeah. Because it would just take a picture of your pocket. Mm-hmm. That would be extremely creepy if, like, you remember taking these photos and you remember taking these other other photos. And in between those sets of photos, mm. there was a picture you did not remember taking that had some creepy entity on it. I have so many blurry photos. Like, I'm trying to take a picture of the dogs. But then I get distracted and I look over here and then my finger hits it and I end up with a blurry picture of the hallway. Mm, I don't I don't have those. Oh, I have loads of them, probably because I'm so spazzy. And all I can think is that if all of a sudden there was something, I would like have all the protection tools out. There would be so many (laughs) salt lines. I would be smoke cleansing everything. Like I would be losing my shit. Okay. Okay. I gotta gotta hope that doesn't happen then. Well, or maybe super fun. Or maybe. (laughs) Hey, Dan and Lindsay, I've been a longtime fan of Dan's comedy. And once he's allowed back in Canada and COVID's (sighs) contained, I look forward to a live show. I love Time Suck and Scared to Death. Lindsay and Dan equal adorable relationship goals. Oh, that's nice. That's so sweet. I'm a true creeper, and I think you'll love this. Okay, on to my story. This is actually a story and a photo from a friend I have their permission to share about the shadow people in her home. She and her family lived in a beautiful old harm farmhouse and from time to time they would all occasionally catch glimpses of shadows out of the corners of their eyes they would enter the kitchen to find cupboards open and feel a presence in certain areas of their home my friend says that the shadow people were never malevolent and never tried to interact she would even speak to them and they all cohabitated in a beautiful century home quite happily one day my friend's daughter was sitting on the bed in the master bedroom She was playing with her new digital digital camera, snapping random photos all around the room and down the hallway. 
after taking a picture of the empty hallway, she was shocked to see that on the screen, there was a clear silhouette of a shadow entity, much taller than any Mm. member of the household, almost the height of the ceiling. She looked up again, and the hallway was still completely empty. I've attached the picture since she told me about this many years ago. I've been fascinated with it. I'm grateful when she said it was okay to share it with you all. Stay spoopy. S. S. Thank you. Okay, Joe, let's see that picture. And I... What? Oh, wow. I, I was not expecting it to be that vivid. Uh-huh. That just gave me the chills. I was expecting, you know, a lot of times they say like, oh, I caught this ghost in this photo. I know. And I see it and I'm disappointed 99.9% of the time. Same. And so I expected like uh, a little wispy, smoky blur. Right. And, and they're reading into it. But that's, that I can't just even looks look at like it. a fucking dude. That looks like, like a, a giant fucking dude. So like again, wearing like a cloak or something. Again, God, again, that to, is creepy. Again, to just give you context, young girl. Master bedroom, new digital camera, fucking around with it, taking pictures, bedroom, hallway. When she takes the picture, she knows there's no one in the hallway, right? Right. She's just messing with it, like the way that kids play with any new toy. It's so unnatural, the shape. I know. Then she goes in the, you know, she's whatever on her digital camera, you know, thumbing over, mm-hmm. you know, the, I remember the four-way cross, da, 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 da. She's like, what the fuck? She goes back in the hallway just to make sure, still no one there. Yeah, that's, because it's like, you know. I, How do you I, deny that? I know. I can't look. <laughs> Because I, I would think like well, maybe it's like a thumb, you know, like when somebody's nope. uh, thumb gets over like the 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 lens, or it's just like um, you know some artifact in the camera, like like a digital camera. They can like yes. carry over previous things. Yeah, but that just and Is I've it seen gone? no nope. it's, uh, zoomed in. I've seen plenty of like digital art that looks like an old executioner type rope, but it's just that's such a specific <sighs> odd shape. Ah. to be like a digital error. I do not care for that. Wow, that's really disturbing. It really, really is. Man. <sighs> okay, thanks, Joe. No Ooh. more. Right? That was way better than I expected. I know, I know. Oh, and, and, and just by the way, if okay, you're, if you're a new, list, new listener, like photos uh, <laughs> from these episodes, oh. they get they get posted to um, at Scared to Death podcast at Insta- on Instagram or Facebook. I thought you were going to say, in case you're a new listener... I'm only banned from Canada. <laughs> well, that also. You could just look. Because oh. I do get messages like, we. I see messages come through like, why is Dan not allowed in Canada? Yeah, he got a DUI. Uh, that I talked about on an old stand-up album. I know. What, this. what track, what's the track called? Mm, do you I remember? remember. Like Too Pinky Thumbs or something? Like nah, slide, nah, nah. Power Slide? Power Slide, maybe. Power Slide. It is a very funny story in retrospect. Terrible decision. Terrible. Don't yeah. drink and drive. No, but, but yeah. But so Dan can't go to Canada. Soon, I think. It's like it's the longest it's band. It's like seven absurd. years or something? No, it's 13 years. Oh, it's 13 Fucking years? 13 year ban. And I think we have to get an... Which immig- is insane. But I mean, okay, I, I made the mistake, but that's a long time. I think we have to get an immigration lawyer to like clear it all up too. Or just wait two more years. Okay, well, I guess we'll go to Banff in two years. See you there. <laughs> I would really love to go to Lake Lucille. I'd love to go to Toronto. You can go. Well, the point is to share these memories together. Yeah. Okay. I feel like the fans would be really disappointed if I went to Canada without you after all this Canada talk. <sighs> okay. So I'm going to follow up that little story with, again, like another kind of smaller story, but then we have a really nice, big, chunky one at the end. Now, this story definitely has a tragic overtone. There's a, a big loss in here. It's really sad. But it has us revisiting that idea that kids are more open to the spirit world than maybe we are. Mm -hmm. And I've read this story several times over, and I just cannot figure out how this fan, Danielle, who sends in this story, how she could have known what she did unless she was visited by the spirit. I just, I can't. So uh, it'll be interesting to hear your take, like, if you think, well, maybe this got said or that, you know, like, Mm -hmm. whatever. Um, Okay. And then it also had me thinking about, remember that story that you told a couple weeks ago about the woman who solved her own murder case? Yes. Okay. Teresita Bassa. Yes, that's the one. It had me thinking about, you know, if you can give directions or instructions beyond the grave. And then Mm. I was thinking like, well, if like the ghost can get like what he or she wants, like what else can it do? Mm -hmm. You know, like what can it convince you to do? What can it convince you not to do? Um, I mean, like if 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 a ghost gives you instructions and then you do it, do they then have like more for you? Hmm. Like like Teresita, mm-hmm. she once her case was solved, right? Then the, she was gone. Away. Yeah. But like, what if? I just this is so ridiculous. I imagined like a queue of ghosts, and they're like, all right, okay, she did that for you, cool. And then it's like it's oh, like giving funny. a referral. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, okay, yeah. She'll, she'll do that for you. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, okay, let's hear from Danielle. 
Hey, suck master and queen of the suck, Dan and Lindsay. Longtime time sucker, new listener to Scared to Death. Ah, uh, thank you. Because I am the most chicken shit person I know. I love you both, and I wanted to share my support as a listener, and I decided to put on my big girl panties and give it a go. <laughs> I'm about, I heard about sending in your own stories, and I have had multiple situations in my life of some super scary shit happening that I just can't explain. As I mentioned, I'm a super wuss, and I do not enjoy the fact that these things have happened to me time and time again. I've tried to even convince myself that there was another reason for these things happening. But here we go. Yip, yip, yah. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's not really a word. That's not yip. I know, but for, yip, yip, yeah. for lack of, I don't know how, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, it, sometimes it comes out more as a yip. Uh, oh, okay. Yip, yip, yah. There we go. Thank you. When I was a kid, around maybe eight or ten years old, my mom worked with a woman who very tragically lost her three-year-old son to a drowning accident on the 4th of July. I was fairly sheltered from it as I was young, and my mom didn't want to be discussing such a tragedy with me. Yeah. I did not go to the hospital when he was on life support or attend the funeral or the wake. My mom did, however, take me along to their house to drop off groceries and meals as she did have another child to care for. An important detail of this story is that I had met the coworker before, but only once in the office that she worked in with my mom. I had never seen a photo of her deceased son and knew mm. a bare minimum about this family. As I entered the house, this wave of emotion came over me. My eyes started darting around the entryway of the house, which went straight into their living room. I looked at the walls and shelves, quickly scanning, as if looking over the area for things that were missing. An anger came over me and I kept thinking a thought in my head. Where are all my pictures? Where are all my pictures? There was no obvious spots where things were, but now were gone. Where things were, but were now gone. No blank spaces on walls, clean areas around dust, and so on. It just looked like a normal family home. I was a very shy kid, so I did not bring attention to myself in any way. I just internalized all this emotion sweeping over me. That night, I slept in my mom's room as my dad was out of town. I woke in the middle of the night crying. My mom woke up and was trying to console me, asking me what was wrong. I kept saying over and over, you don't see him? You don't see him? You don't see that little boy? She was clearly freaked out at this point, saying that no, she in fact did not see anything. I vividly remember seeing an apparition of a small child standing at the foot of my mom's bed. No words or motions, he was just there. I finally wore myself out from crying and fell back asleep, though I'm sure my poor mom did not sleep after that. When I woke up in the morning, my mom came to me right away and asked what the hell happened last night. And I right away said, where are all of his pictures, mom? My mom's jaw just dropped. She put it all together. I didn't know if she had mentioned it right away or if some time had passed, but she did ask the mother if she had taken down her son's photos. The mother shared that her husband couldn't stand to be reminded of their mm. loss and that, yes, they had taken down all the photos of their son in the house. I, I do not think my mom told her what happened just due to the sensitivity of it all, but told her that it may be important to maybe have him remembered by having a few photos up. I did have a few more experiences with the little boy as I grew up. The mother was pregnant with a baby girl shortly after he passed, and I became the babysitter for the family. While babysitting once, uh, while babysitting once the little girl, once she was off coloring on a bench and her other brother was clear across the room playing video games. She kept shrugging her shoulders as if to say, stop it, to her older brother. After watching, do her, after watching her do this multiple times, I informed her he was clear across the room. She looked a little embarrassed and simply said, oh. Soon after that, she informed her aunt and her mom that she often sees a little boy in the house. So, yep. That's my story. I've tried to find ways to explain it, but I just can't. Thank you for the time and effort you put into all the shows. Stay scared, Danielle. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah. Weird. Mm-hmm. It is weird just to have, like, her and then this other little kid, you know, like, verify, like, what, what she's seen and then the some type of communication between her and this spirit of this kid she never met. Mm-hmm. I like that he was pissed. Mm -hmm. He's like, hey, hey. Yeah, I'm just, remember me. Well, and what I think about that too is that it's he passed when he was three. That's such a childlike behavior. Like, look at me. What about me? What about me? Like, where's my picture? Where's my stuff? You know, like mm -hmm. little kids are so self-centered mm -hmm. um, that it, it just kind of clicked in my brain that like, oh yeah, 
Like, of course. I mean, we'd all be sad. Like, if I died right now and you took down the photos of me in our house, that's that would be in my rational non-ghost brain yeah. like i would get it you know it's just it's painful it's sad you don't need to be reminded every day but a little kid doesn't get that so if ghosts have the same kind of rationale or ration yeah reasoning rationale thank you yeah yeah rationale is us then he would be pissed because mm-hmm. he's just a little three-year-old baby i know that's just a weird thing to think about uh that if you know you die you can hang around like as some type of apparition yeah what that would be like if you do that as like a toddler where you just, I mean, you're just oh, so confused. You're probably so scared. You're all alone. Right. I mean, potentially. I don't know if you're hanging out with other things or. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. That, that, that reminds me of like so many horror movies where like it makes sense. Like the motive where it's like, you know, there's uh, uh, the ghost of a child or something. And then the, and then the ghost gets angry mm-hmm. because it, it is confused. It doesn't like that there's new people in the house and then starts acting out. And then that kind of like the whole poltergeist activity. Yeah. There's like a weird logic to it where, mm-hmm. of course, the spirit is acting out if that spirit exists in that sense. Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't know what's happening. It is angry irrationally like a kid is angry irrationally. But, right. but exaggerated right. because like of the circumstances. Yeah. yeah, like a little meltdown. Mm-hmm. Okay, so last but definitely not least, we have an anonymous story. And uh, yes, it mm-hmm. is about a shadow person. This entity actually doesn't seem to mean anyone any harm. Yeah. Uh, which actually, I don't think that necessarily any of these did. That first one, we don't have any detail. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that there was any harm. And, and the person living in the house in that first story even said, like, we, we lived together. I mean, yeah. it never yeah. seemed to bother anyone. But it explores this idea that... Could I have an attachment and then pass it on to someone else? Mm. Like, can you kind of like hand it off unbeknownst to you? Yeah. So I, I, I love this story. Okay. Hey, guys, love the podcast. I've, li- I've been listening for a while and wanted to send in my own story. I was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and lived with my mom at her aunt's house, along with her two daughters, for quite a few years before moving to the States. I was about four or five years old at the time, but I remember always thinking that my aunt's house was haunted, though this was my normal. Specifically, the doors would open and close by themselves, and weirdly, the couches seemed to constantly be moving and screeching and scratching across the floor. Apparently, though, no one could hear or see it except for me. I would simply push the couches back a couple inches into their original position, but soon enough, I'd hear them moving once more. Every time I said something about it, I was dismissed with a simple laugh or a lame excuse because, of course, as a kid, your credibility is often lost due to your age and it's blamed on your imagination. These weren't the only things that led me to believe that my aunt's house was haunted. I had this reoccurring experience that cemented it for me. While my mom was at work, one of my cousins would stay and watch me. And by watch me, I mean they would be in their rooms, probably on MySpace or whatever was popular in 2005. (laughs) I wasn't hard to take care of as long as I was watching Courage the Cowardly Dog, my favorite show at the time. Every single day after I'm after my mom went to work and my cousin went to her room, there he was, the shadow man, right against the wall outside my door just a few feet away. I had seen him every day for as long as I can remember. He stands there and he watches. He has no face that I could see. He seems to be about six feet tall, but me having been so young, it might have just been based off my perception. He'd watch me for hours every day. I never felt like he wanted to harm me or anyone else for that matter, but it did always feel uneasy having someone watching you. Nonetheless, very rarely, there would also be a little kid kind of peeking at me. He would peer around the corner of the doorframe to my room that I shared with my mom. I would spot him out of my peripheral, and if I looked fast enough, I could see him sort of hiding behind the wall again, as if he was scared or getting caught or maybe even playing a one-sided game of hide-and-go-seek. But the man was my main concern. Four-year-old me had a bit of an attitude. Mm -hmm. I'd get irritated that he wouldn't stop staring at me, and I would even get more irritated that I had to get up off my bed, walk a couple of feet, and close the door to make him go away. To me, this felt like a chore. And each time I did this, as if he want, it's as if he wanted to be petty right back at me because once I'd sit back down, he'd somehow turn off my TV, making me groan. We had lost the remote and the idea of having to get up and turn it back on to my four-year-old self seemed rather annoying. And that was my usual emotion towards him. Annoyance. I was never paranoid because of him or scared or had trouble sleeping. I simply remember just being annoyed. 
He'd been gone. He'd be gone by the time my mom came home from work, but I still dreaded the next day when she would have to leave again. And I looked forward to the days that she was home because he wouldn't show up as much. And if he did, of course, she'd be nowhere in sight, vanishing once more when my mom would come back. But like, but he liked to make his presence known to me. I thought this would change once my aunt came to visit, and I told her about the strange noises and movements with the couches. Seeing the shadow man was one thing, but I just wanted someone else to believe me about the damn couches. That was starting to really frustrate me. My mom seemed to be getting tired of my stories and told my aunt to just ignore me. That same night, we had all gone to bed. My aunt decided to stay up a bit later. I was feeling pretty restless that night and stayed up as well just lying in my bed in the dark, letting my imagination run wild. My aunt came knocking on the bedroom door, not waiting until we answered, and instead peeked her head inside and whispered to my mom, Are you still awake? My mom, a light sleeper, was annoyed that her sister was waking her up this late at night. When she asked her what she wanted, my aunt whispers, whispered back, She was right. My mom, still half asleep, asked what she was talking about, to which my aunt said, The couches. She was right. I heard it. My mom just rolled her eyes, annoyed that she'd been woken up to what she believed was nonsense and mumbled, just take her with you. And with that, I stayed up late with my aunt, feeling a little bit of triumph. We never talked about it again. All of this was when I was eight. The same thing over and over, every day like clockwork, up until the point that my mom started questioning why I kept closing the door. I never told her, knowing there'd be no point if she didn't believe me about everything else, even with my aunt as a witness. The day before our flight to the United States, he appeared to me one last time, right outside my door, staring at me as usual. This time, I felt sort of a wave of sadness overcome me. I don't know if those were his emotions or mine. A part of me was weirdly going to miss him. I didn't close the door this time. I just let him stand there, watching over me. I glanced over at him, as I often would, and it caught me off guard to see him move this time. He raised his hand up, a pretty normal-looking hand, oddly enough, and waved at me, as if saying goodbye. I never saw him again after that. The years passed, and I thought I was clear of anything paranormal. Since I moved out of that house, I had had no new experiences. That is until, one day after school, I was in the car with my stepdad. After a long silence, he spoke. So, your mom told me not to tell you this, but she saw a shadow walk into your room. (laughs) And instantly, like a flipped switch, all the memories I had put behind me came flooding back. Even even still, I kept my cool and replied nonchalantly, Uh, him? Yeah, he's my buddy. My stepdad laughed, not knowing that there was some truth behind my banter. Curiosity got the best of me, and when I got home, I ratted out my stepdad. I asked my mom about it, and she gave my dad the, Really? Look? To which he shrugged, also intrigued. She went on to explain to me that while she was in her bedroom the other day, my room is right next to hers, she saw what she thought was me walking by into my bedroom. She called out, asking if I was already home from school, but no reply. Confused, she went to check my room, only to find it was empty. Maybe her mind was playing tricks on her, so she shrugged it off, not thinking much of it, until it happened again. And again, and again, and again, until we moved. I then proceeded to tell her what I had experienced at her aunt's house all those years ago. My mom told me that sometimes it's it's not the house that's haunted, it's the person. Not exactly what I wanted to hear, but it did make sense. She then shared with me a story from when I was a toddler. I would often stand and stare at a wall, sometimes babbling at it. Once I learned how to talk, I would have conversations with this said wall. This made me wonder if I had been with my shadow man all along, if I had always seen him, if he had always been there, and if he still was. Was that why I was never scared of him? Because I had spent my whole childhood with him. Was I conditioned not to fear him? She continued to tell me how she used to be sensitive to the supernatural as well. In her teen years, a shadow man would appear in her room. However, unlike me, she was terrified. Was it because he appeared to her later in life? She said she would wrap herself up in her blankets for protection, eventually falling asleep. It didn't last long for my mom. Her mother was religious, and while I don't know all the details, I do know she lit some special candles (laughs) while saying a specific prayer, and he simply went away. It immediately made me wonder if he had ever actually left her or had he somehow attached himself to me. My mom stopped seeing him years ago, thankfully. I don't see him either, but sometimes I get that weird, overwhelming sensation that he's right outside my door, waiting to watch me once more. 
I live alone with my cat, and I keep the door open to let her roam around as she pleases. Whenever I wake up from my deep sleep, and I mean I'm so deep of a sleeper I need like six alarms and have even slept through an earthquake, I always jolt jolt awake in a panic. I glance right outside my door expecting to see him once more. I'm never able to go back to sleep until that feeling dissipates, until I'm certain he has left. Who knows, maybe I'm just paranoid, but for some reason, I'm someone who can fall easily asleep after scary movies and stories and even my own imagination, but I find it hard to believe that sometimes it's my own head messing with me. They say ignorance is bliss, but sometimes not knowing is far more scary. Hmm. My, uh, my mind was going to like the weirdest place when, you, when I was thinking about like uh, this thing, you know, multiple generations kind of like attaching and, you know, and, and moving on to the next person. Yeah. And then just like lingering around. <laughs> like, what if they're like, okay, like <laughs> super weird thought. Okay, bring it on. But what if this, okay, somebody dies. Yeah. Th- and then like there they go, they're in the ghost plane. And then some kind of like ghost administrators are like, <laughs> okay, you can't move on to the next plane, uh, yeah. you know, which is like the good place you want to be until you can get somebody from this family to like, Go put some flowers on your tombstone. And so this thing is hanging around, hanging around, but it's just like, it doesn't quite have the power to just ask, like, can you please just put some flowers so I can just leave you people alone? <laughs> like, like the enormity of that frustration. If just yeah. like for decades, you're like, oh, all I can do is like hang around this door and just watch. Right. I can't go in. Oh, I, I can't just, go past. If I could just figure out how to say what I want to say, I could finally leave these people. Yeah. Like some that weird. That is funny. Yeah. I just had a yeah, very random thought pop in my head. But, I'm, but I do wonder, I'm like, why does okay let's say it's it's real and mm-hmm. th- there are these shadowy entities that can attach themselves to people why would it ha- why would an entity like that hang around a family for so long why would it hang around anywhere it's just such mm-hmm. a weird thought that i don't know i just hadn't had in a while like what 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 is the point mm-hmm. what, what's it doing what's it gaining okay well maybe it's not gaining anything but maybe it is a former relative maybe it's an ancestor mm, just and watching over them because this person... There's nothing scary with that one. No, they say... I mean, to me, the, the scary part of it is that we just don't know what it is, right? Correct. The fear of the unknown and, like, they're saying, like, they don't have an answer, you know? Because even now as an adult, she's saying, sometimes I feel like yeah. he's still there and I, I don't see him anymore. Just like yep. her mom mm-hmm. stopped seeing mm-hmm. him eventually as well. It's like... If this person were to have children, would then would that child yeah. then see it as well? But it, it doesn't feel un. Yeah. It, is, it is unnerving. It just. But it's it not malevolence or anything. Right. I mean, and that's an interesting thought. Just to you know, we we've expressed that numerous times here, but just something good to remember. Yeah. That you know, if a bunch of these stories are true, and there are these things you know out there, which I'm leaning more and more towards, like it's, it just has to be after some of these stories. Yeah. That it doesn't mean that they're all bad. Yeah. You know that there could be plenty Sorry. of these. Entities that actually do scare the hell out of people. Right, right. That are just like, okay, I think about like the classic like footsteps in the attic, Mm -hmm. you know, and and those kind of noises. That doesn't mean that it's, uh, you know, malicious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It it could just be something pacing. Mm -hmm. It could just be something just trapped in whatever little moment in time or Mm -hmm. whatever little plane of its existence that is just doing its thing and you happen to hear it. And it creeps you out, but not because it's creepy. Mm -hmm. As I was working on these, I know I mentioned this before, I was feeling a little bit different in our house, Mm -hmm. specifically with this last story. And I was like, wait, what if, what if the guy that lived here that passed away that we don't, we don't have confirmation one way or the other if he passed away in our house or not. Mm -hmm. But what we do know for anybody who is just joining us, what we do know is that there was a a guy that lived in our house, a single dad Mm -hmm. with two kids, and it was his brother's house. So, okay, so everybody moves into the uncle's house and the father has a heart attack and he passes away. We don't know where it happened, but that's what put the house on the market Mm -hmm. is that the kids went back to live with their mom full time and I don't know where the uncle went. Mm -hmm. What if he is trapped there? Probably in the attic. The uncle. No, but sorry. What if he is trapped there? Mm. But what if he doesn't mind being trapped there? What if he is looking for his kids again? What if he's looking out for our kids? What if the feeling that I... It's not as if mm. I ever said that the feeling that I feel in our house occasionally is is something that I think is out to harm me. It's, yeah. It is scary to me because I don't understand. Right. Because you can't... And you can't get that information. You right, can't... And I don't yeah. want it. I don't want it because I don't like the unknown. That is the biggest... Yeah piece of why scared to death scares me so much is that i don't care for the unknown i am a planner i like a list Mm -hmm. i like facts i like figures i like everything black and white i don't do fucking good with the gray and it's very much a gray area Mm -hmm. 
But as I was working on this, I had a couple moments where like, I thought, I'm like, did I hear something? And then I was like, no, it's over my shoulder. Like just quite a bit of that. Mm -hmm. And moreover, when we were talking about this, like if you're, if you're stuck in the same spot over and over, that does make sense to me in our house because I hear the same kind of sound Mm -hmm. from the same part of our house at the same time of day regularly. It's not every day, but it's consistent enough that I'm like, oh, yep, there's that sound again coming from the space around Kyler's room. Like, what is that? I don't know, but could you ask it to fix that little uh, slow leak under our kitchen sink? (laughs) I'll get right on it. I mean, what else is it doing? We we could ask him or Joe. Joe's like part-time plumber. (laughs) (laughs) I love the idea of, like, the ghost and our world crossing over yeah. yeah but to them we're the ghosts and they're just like get out of here <laughs> like like <laughs> the little girl's watching the shadow man but in the shadow man's world he's like what is that the little girl's always here oh yeah yeah, yeah. why is she I staring at like, me why is she staring at me like it's get all out yeah it's that inverted yeah it's inverted we're the ghosts we're, mm-hmm. the, we're not leaving them alone oh that kind of ties back to the first story yeah of these parallel dimensions what if they bleed over a little bit and wh- while someone else's world is bleeding into ours yeah we're bleeding into theirs and that's 100 percent true interesting i, I was hoping that i could leave like a honey do list for the ghost you suggested right. that our ghost could fix this the kitchen sink that's like yeah, dust the top like, of the cabinets oh please could you there's like a few like uh i noticed a little like oh need a paint touch up oh there's like a this right. oh, come on buddy seal the back patio it really <laughs> needs it <laughs> get to work earn your keep okay buddy boy mm-hmm. do you want to do some shout outs yeah me first or you first uh you okay uh, I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Thank you so much to Tim Lex, Angela Valentine, Noah Olson, Zanella Lascano, Debbie Cassidy, Mindy and Kevin Barnes, Coop, no last name, Emma Platt, Jordan Berry, longtime fan. I know Jordan Berry. Thank you, Jordan. Blair Harms, Hope Willis, Carissa Murphy, Sadie Green, Don Lorson, and Andrew Carson. Boom. Boom. You, you did really well. They, they weren't too challenging They this weren't week. too, too bad. Okay, I would like to thank the following Annabelles for their support. Gregory Osgood, Travis Maynard, Karen Proctor, Joseph Keeling, Sarah Calloway, Emily Green, Michelle and Arthur Grigg, Sanders, no last name given, or maybe that is the last name, I couldn't mm. decide, mm-hmm. Sarah Bowers, Jeff, no last name given, Cameron Dixon, Logan, no last name, Karina Monte. Hmm. Monterubio, Amy Carey, and I don't know if this is Marigou or Marigo, mm-hmm. M-A-R-A-G-A-U-X. I'm going to go with Marigo. Yeah, I think so. Marigo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, I just wanted to say this because, you know, we always say like, oh, thanks for supporting the show. Mm-hmm. We know that you're all out there supporting the show. We know that not everybody yeah. can afford to oh, be a course. patron. And we totally get it. And we're just happy that you're here. Yeah. And we know sometimes that like a monthly commitment is not a possibility, but you support yeah. the show, yes, by listening, but we also appreciate when you buy the merch, when you come to the live yeah. shows, when Dan's touring again, like you come back out. So thank you for all of the ways yep. because of your support in all of the different facets, we are able to give that Patreon mm-hmm. money away. Yeah, right? absolutely. I mean, it's a it's a group effort. So collectively, we thank all of you for being here. Yep. And then I have a few spooky shout outs. Good. Okay. To Chasen from Whitley, happy belated birthday. To Chris, aka Bam Bam. <laughs> from Heather, also a happy belated birthday. To Rose from your dad, Jason, happy birthday. To Danielle from Dario, love you, and thanks for sharing Scared to Death with me. To Cassandra from Seth, love you, happy birthday. And to Candace from Blake, love you, happy birthday. So many June So many babies. love you, happy birthdays. I know. <laughs> uh, and that is all for today. Thank you for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith on social media and doing the uh, BadMagicMerch.com designs. Store at BadMagicProductions.com for customer service. Thanks to Joe Paisley for producing and directing today. Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And thanks to Sarah Finch for finding the basis of the first story. And Sophie Evans for pointing me towards the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content. And to see the pictures from the show at Scared to Death Podcast. And go to the private Facebook group, group, Creeps and Peepers, for horror lovers. Thanks to Liz Hernandez for moderating that. And if you don't want to hear more ads, if you want bonus episodes, a merch discount, the This Looks Awesome Horror Movie Viewing Party, and review and more, check out our Patreon. And most importantly, enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, 
fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through but have no home here within scared to death. Mad Magic Productions.